Welcome to All Economy Music. My name's Alistair, and today's lesson is Guitar Phrasing Explained. We're going to talk about how you can sound less like a scale and more musical in your improvisation. By the end of today's lesson, you will know what a motif is, how to use phrases to build motifs, how to chain phrases together to form interesting solos, and how to change phrases on the fly to keep your solo interesting and engaging. Make sure you watch the whole video so you can see how all these ideas work together to create interesting solos. With that out of the way, let's dive right into it. What is a motif? A motif is a little musical idea that you're going to use to build your solo around. It's going to act as a point of repetition that you can use as a hook to draw the listener in. And this repetition is important because in the words of Adam Neely, repetition legitimizes. By repeating a motif throughout the solo, it gives the listener something to hook onto, and it also helps the solo to make sense to them. If you just go around playing random phrases in a random chain, there's no structure to that. But by adding a motif, you add a sort of skeleton to your solo that you can then use to improvise around. In my opinion, music is a lot like language. And when you start to think of music more like a language, what people end up playing tends to sound, in my opinion, more musical. When it comes to phrasing, I think having a language perspective on stuff really helps to communicate the musical ideas that you're trying to speak through your instrument. So let's talk about phrases and how you can use those to turn into a motif and uh, the sort of language things you should be thinking about when you're playing these phrases. When you think of spoken language like English or French or Spanish or Japanese, name any language, it People don't really think of the letters they're using as they speak. Instead, they think of the words. And this is despite the fact that every word you speak is made up of a subset of letters, right? A scale is a lot like the alphabet. A scale is just a set of notes that you can recombine together to make musical ideas like phrases and licks and riffs and all that kind of stuff, right? Just as the alphabet is a set of letters that you can recombine to make words. But when you go around speaking to people, like I say, you don't go around thinking of the letters that you're using, and you certainly don't go around speaking the alphabet to people, expecting it to make sense. And therefore, it doesn't really make sense to uh, play music in the same way. If you improvise and you take a scale and you just kind of play notes randomly, it starts to not really make any sense. It's it's just nonsense, and it's exactly the same effect if I was just to start speaking the alphabet to you. It would just be nonsense. However, most spoken language is kind of uh, uses a core set of vocabulary to communicate its ideas, and then if you had to communicate an idea that was particularly novel, so kind of unique, or an idea um, that is more complex, maybe you have um, a unique kind of word that would communicate those ideas. From this perspective, it kind of makes sense that you're going to want to have a basic set of vocabulary that you use to uh, improvise with. And then if you want to play something more outside, then uh, you can either make something up or you can go looking for further vocabulary that better communicates your idea. So really the question then becomes, how do I acquire vocabulary? Vocabulary is probably one of the most important aspects when it comes to phrasing. I'm not going to just play my scale randomly. I'm going to use specific preconceived of words or phrases um, to communicate musical ideas with. When children learn how to speak, we don't teach them the alphabet. Children learn through mimicry and they copy full words that their parents are using. And that's how you go about acquiring musical vocabulary. You need to mimic the kind of players that you want to sound like. So if I really like the playing of Joe Bonamassa, I need to learn some Joe Bonamassa licks that speak to me. And if I really like uh, Josh Smith's playing, then I really need to learn some Josh Smith licks so that I can speak a bit like Josh Smith as such. There are lots of resources online that you can use to develop your vocabulary from. So if you did a Google search for minor pentatonic licks, you'd find a raft of vocabulary that uses the minor pentatonic scale. My opinion though is that if you really want to learn vocabulary that speaks the way you want to speak, you should listen to the guitar players you really like and steal the licks that uh, really speak to you. Whether that is stealing them by ear and figuring them out on your own or finding a lick book that happens to have the licks that you like already transcribed in them, 
copying the players that you really like rather than just some random set of licks on the internet is the best way to learn vocabulary that speaks the way you want to speak. That being said though, if you would like some licks that uh, will get you f away from playing a scale and actually playing phrases and motifs, you can find uh, five licks in the lesson pack for this lesson on my website, allacarnamusic.com. So if that's something of the interest in you, check out the description below. Um, there's a link to it. It's pay what you want for a pound a month, and it's a really great way to support what I do here on YouTube. So the next step after you've learned some phrases is to start trying to use them in your improvisation. You're basically going to force them in so that they become part of your vocabulary. Initially, they're not going to be very good. You're going to be figuring out how do I use this phrase? Where does it sound good? Where does it sound bad? Uh, it's going to be trial and error, essentially, but that's okay. I think this kind of practice is really fun. It's kind of free because really there's no right or wrong. It's just what do I like the sound of? What I've got here is a demonstration of a couple of phrases. And it's basically one phrase that acts as the motif for most of the solo. And then there's a second motif that comes at the end. So what I'm doing here is I'm using a phrase as a motif. And that phrase gets played a bunch of times. And then at the end of the solo, I have a second phrase, which is like a secondary motif that kind of wraps the whole thing up. Another way of thinking about this kind of idea is call and response, and you might have come across this idea before. Call and response is where you play one phrase, so maybe you played and then you have a response to it. The first one is the call, the second one is the response. You could also think of it as a question and an answer. So this is my question, and here's my answer. Call and response is a great way to start integrating multiple phrases into your vocabulary. You use one phrase as the call, it is motif number one, and then you use a second phrase as your response, and that is motif number two. So that is the next kind of tip for turning your scale into actual phrasing, is to first get some phrases, so you're not speaking the alphabet, you're speaking words, and then what you're going to do is use a tool like uh, call and response and a motif to kind of hook the listener in. So you're going to use your phrase a few times round, that's your motif, and then maybe you use that as the call, and then motif number two, that is your response. So far, you have some phrases and you're kind of using a phrase as a motif to hook the listener in and maybe you're using call and response as a way to add some variety to that motif. There's one really important thing though, as you're doing all of these, that you really need to take into account and that is leaving space. If you don't leave space in your improvisation, the meaning of your motif is going to get lost because the listener won't be able to tell where one idea ends and the next idea begins. In spoken language, we leave pauses in our speech because if I don't, you're going to not understand what I'm saying for you. It'll be really hard for you to keep track of what I'm saying if I don't put any pauses in my speech. We do this naturally, but as guitar players, when it comes to playing, we don't have to breathe. And therefore, I can play as many licks as I want as fast as I can. I don't have to put any gaps in there because everybody should hear my solo from start to end with no space. Um, it is really easy as a guitar player to do that because you don't have to take a breath. When guitar players solo, they tend to try and emulate vocalists. Whether you realize it or not, great guitar players are really kind of just emulating a singer. We're trying to humanize this piece of metal and wood so that it doesn't sound like... Instead, it sounds like... The second one's way more musical because there's gaps in there, there's rhythm there, it sounds a lot more like language. So now that you've kind of worked your vocabulary in, here are some techniques you can use to modify that vocabulary on the fly so that you can continue to take advantage of it, but um, make it sound unique as you go. 
So the first way is to kind of modify that vocabulary via pitch. So if this is your phrase, if you went, um, you don't actually have to end on that note. You could go, or you could go, or maybe you go, all I did was change the pitch content. I chose another note out of the scale as opposed to um, the ones that came pre-written in the phrase as such. I liken this to taking a word like run and turning it into the word runner or running, or you could change the front of the word so it becomes fun or none. This is pretty fun thing to practice in my opinion. You can take a phrase and see how many times, how many ways can I break this phrase? How many ways can I play this phrase so that it sounds the same but different. How many unique phrases can I generate out of this one idea? course the question becomes what notes do I play? Well most phrases exist within a scale so if you've got some minor pentatonic vocabulary then your minor pentatonic notes are all going to work pretty well. A more advanced idea would be to use notes from the chords you're playing over that would be another thing you could do or if you wanted to be kind of spicy use a note from outside the scale so that you add some tension in but I think the most important thing in my opinion is how you finish the phrase. Make sure you land on a strong note because if you land on a note that is not in the chord or not in the scale, it's going to sound very incomplete. If I play this phrase, you're kind of waiting for me to go. You have to pick a good note to kind of end on. It'll come out of experience. A note from the chord is always a good choice for that kind of thing though. Another option would be to change the rhythm content of your phrase. So rather than changing the pitch content, you mess with the rhythm. Play some section of the phrase fast or in another section of the phrase slower. You kind of stretch the time in some areas and compress it in other places. That'd be one thing you could do. You could try taking a phrase that is swung and playing it unswung. You could try taking a phrase that is not triplets and turning it into triplets. Change the subdivision up. There's loads of things you can kind of do. Again, it's trial and error. See what you kind of set, like the sound of. Have a mess around with taking a phrase and distorting the rhythm within it to try and create a new phrase. The final kind of modification that you could think about is uh, articulation. So take a phrase and change the way you articulate it. So articulation is how does the phrase sound? Does it sound aggressive? Does it sound soft and kind of passive? Like what do you want the phrase to sound like? So maybe if, this, if the phrase is just picked, then uh, you could try adding some legato into it, like hammer-ons and slides. If the phrase has a bend in it, rather than bending, slide up to that higher pitch. Mess around with articulations. There's loads of ways you can do it. Uh, there's loads of suggestions for this kind of stuff in the lesson pack on the website. So think about how can I change the articulations within this phrase to make it sound different from what it does already. <laughs> So there are some basic 
scale phrasing ideas, what you want to do is make sure you don't just play the notes out of the scale, because that's kind of like speaking the alphabet. Instead, you want to use some words. So learn some phrases from musicians that you like. Learn some vocabulary that exists within the scale rather than just playing the scale itself. Then you're going to start using that vocabulary in your improvisation. So you're going to use one of those phrases as like a hook, essentially, in the solo. It acts as a motif. And then you could also incorporate something like call and response to add a bit of variety in. Once you kind of baked in that vocabulary, you could try modifying the vocabulary on the fly. So changing the pitch content of the phrase or changing the rhythm content of the phrase on the go. And then the other thing you can try on the modifications front is articulations. How am I playing the note? Am I playing it loud? Am I playing it soft? Um, is it hammer on? Is it full of legato? Is it got a string bend or a slide? Like, how am I playing the phrase? How many ways can I play the same phrase? How many ways can I cripple this phrase and turn it into something new? Mess around with it, it's experimentation. You can't go wrong here, it's really about taste. What do I want to hear the sound of? Do I like the sound of this thing or not? Thank you for watching the video. If you learned something new, please leave the video a like. And if there's anything in here that you think might help any guitar players that you know, please share the video with them. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below and I'll try and get back to you. Next week's lesson is going to be on the Dorian mode and how to make it sound more musical as you're improvising with it. If that'd be interesting to you, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you're notified when the video is released. As always, there is the lesson pack for this lesson on olacanamusic.com. It has the licks we talked about. It also has detailed practice notes that you can use to get the most out of this lesson. And it has the jam track from the start of the video, which you can use to practice these improvisational concepts along with. Until next time, good luck with turning your scales into actual phrases and making them sound really musical. And I'll see you for our lesson next Saturday.